All right, welcome everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and good night. Welcome to our SWAT talk on art and activism. This is a premier art talk in a new group of SWAT talks that are aimed around racial justice. We have our lovely panelist, Audrey Chan here. We are going to get started in two to three minutes to let everyone in. So make yourselves comfortable, get a, a comforting beverage, a treat, a notepad, anything to sort of help you um, better engage with this, what is going to be an illustrious and bountiful talk about very important and pertinent topics within our everyday lives. Those are amazing adjectives. Thank you, Juan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy to be in conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you. It's it's the like I, I I was prefacing with the English teacher and me, and I just had a lesson yesterday on on adjectives and words because mm -hmm. students even in high school still like to say good enough. Mm -hmm. We should like, all aspire to be illustrious. Yes. Yes. And you illustriousness and, is a daily practice. Right. 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 And in the art world, there is, I mean, illust illustrious illustrate parallels. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. Exciting. Indeed. Okay. I'm going to get started in about one more minute, just in case mm -hmm. some folks trickle in. I guess we should mention that um, Zoe is not able to join us. Um, uh, unfortunately, there was a, she's not able to make it. So she's with us in spirit and she's an incredible curator. Her show, Soul of a Nation, has traveled all around the world and so inspiring. So look her up if you don't know about her work already. Absolutely. If I can find something, I might drop a link to her work so that you all can do some investigating on in your free time. And thank you so much to the Alumni Council for having me. I, when I got the invitation, I was so excited because mm -hmm. I feel like so connected spiritually to Swarthmore. And um, like at times like these, it's I often think about like the community and the conversations from my time there. And so just opportunity like to talk to you, Tuan, and to kind of dive into these subjects was really exciting. Yes, yes. And even reading and investigating and learning more about them was very enlightening as well um, mm -hmm. to the folks out there. Audrey and I overlapped by one year at Swarthmore, so we didn't quite connect on campus, though we did know of each other and we definitely shared friend circles. So it's sort of nice, you know, this far removed from Swarthmore to encounter faces that were slightly familiar mm -hmm. and are doing amazing things. So with that, Beautiful introduction. We'll get started again to everyone who just came in or who've been here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Welcome to SWAT Talk, Art and Activism. This is the first SWAT Talk, which is uh, organized by the Alumni Council. It's a part of a series of SWAT Talks that are um, centered around racial justice in various disciplines and arenas. My name is Tuan Claiborne. I am class of 2007, educator and drag extraordinary based in New York City. I am here with the lovely Audrey Chan, class of 2004. And I'm going to give you all a little bit of information about our panelists before we get started. Just a couple of reminders, this podcast is being recorded and it will be available um, within two to three weeks from this broadcast. The first half hour will be a conversation question and answer with me and Audrey. 
And at the 30 minute mark, we will begin to open up to questions from the audience. You can type in your questions into the chat and we will make note of those questions to ask. We, when you type your question into the chat, be sure to note your class um, a graduation date from Swarthmore and or affiliation with Swarthmore, whether that be a friend, alumnus, faculty member, et cetera and we will answer those questions accordingly. So just sit back and relax and we are going to begin the show. But like I said, my computer's a little funky right now, so I apologize for not having all of these things pulled up. Where is it? Here we go. About our panelists, Audrey Chan, born in Chicago, is a Los Angeles-based artist and educator. Her research-based projects use drawing, painting, video, and public art to challenge dominant historical narratives through allegories of power, place, and identity. Oof, such, <laughs> oh, love that sentence. She received an MFA from California Institute of Arts and a BA with honors in studio art and political science from Swarthmore College. She was commissioned by Los Angeles Metropolitan LA Metro to create a large scale public artwork entitled Will Power Allegory for the future Little Tokyo slash Arts District Metro Station, which is opening in 2022. She is also a visiting faculty member in the program in art at California Institute of the Arts and the inaugural artist in residence at the ACLU of Southern California. And without further ado, we'd like to welcome e Audrey. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your time with us today. And thank you, Tuan, for the intro. Oh, you're welcome. Our first question, I'm working on my lighting. Sorry, there's, it's just here. Hopefully that's a little bit better. My computer is a little funky. I'll try not to move so much too because I find myself moving and the lighting gets wonky. So hopefully that'll fix itself. Let's get on to our first question though. Considering your well-rounded background um, in growing up in Chicago to immigrant parents, then moving to Chicago, or not Chicago, then moving to Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, and then venturing out to California, there's a lot of places of access for your art and persons. Do you consider yourself an activist? I would say that activism is like an aspiration in my work and activism is like a lifelong pursuit for anyone who engages with it. And I've been lucky enough, um, especially the last couple of years to have projects that allow me to uplift and work directly with um, community organizers and advocates and um, activists and people who I call community culture bearers to like translate their stories into images. And um, especially like the work that um, I worked on for a couple of years with LA Metro, um, it's like how to tell the community stories of Little Tokyo, which is like in the heart of downtown LA, just like south of City Hall and it's like how talking with people over several years about like what stories do they want to carry forward? What, how do they want to be seen? Mm -hmm. um, because I, I come into it not being of those communities. And mm -hmm. so there's like a lot of listening involved and a lot of the work that I do as an artist is about is about like visual storytelling. Mm -hmm. And so I think about like, is al can allegory like be a site of activism? Cause like mm -hmm. the stories that we see in artwork um, can inform like how we see ourselves and like how we see other people and how we see like history and identity. And is that a place where like a kind of intervention can happen? Mm -hmm. And so I think when I think when anyone's asked about activism, it's like, I think it's so important that you can like bring your whole self to mm -hmm. your activism um, uh, and that it can happen in so many different contexts. Like it, 
I think activism is important, like in culture, in schools, in history books, mm -hmm. like in the courts, on the street, you know, like we need it everywhere. And so whether or not, um, I guess you would call your, one would call themselves an activist, like, it's just like, I think it comes out of uh, frustration or um, with the status quo and wanting to commit the work to change it um, and whatever that looks like, you know, and people have so many different like spheres of influence. So it's about like figuring out where yours is. Absolutely, absolutely. And I appreciated that last point you made in terms of folks calling themselves activism, because they're whether we realize it or not, and maybe it's a product of the current climate and how information is so accessible and free flowing. There has been a bit of gatekeeping with calling yourself an activism activist and activism in general and being able to access whatever you are actively fighting for and being able to bring your whole self in without the gatekeeping or chastising certain forms of activism activism is really important and so i'm glad that you brought you brought that up because that is something that we don't even consider if we call ourselves an activist because we have to think about the ways in which it has been marketed and if it's seen positively or negatively depending on what we're being considered an activist for yeah and i yeah i i think it's important when you're talking about community organizing to talk about community organizing because there are like specific strategies within activism that mm -hmm. are more and less visible and more or less um effective in different contexts mm -hmm. um but i guess like as an artist um i have to understand like what are the tools that i have to work with and like, what are the contexts? And um, so whenever I can, I try to like mobilize that to support the work of organizers and advocates. Absolutely. And that actually, your last point segues into our next question, which is, is there a particular moment when you realized art could be a powerful medium of activism or community organizing and storytelling? Yeah, I, um, I think the moment when I realized that um, like art could have a really impactful um, voice on speaking to society and history was when I learned about Maya Lin and her Vietnam Veterans Memorial design. And I think it was specifically when I was like an adolescent seeing uh, the documentary by Frida Lee Mock called like Maya Lin, A Strong Clear Vision. And it was, this saga of her, you know, uh, applying to this blind competition of, um, of designs and her being selected. She was just like a young architecture student. And she's like a young Chinese American woman from the Midwest with academic parents. And that kind of like lined up with my own background. Mm -hmm. And then seeing um, like how there was so much pushback against her aesthetic vision but also like how, how people couldn't accept that her identity um, was chosen to represent like the experience of veterans memorials. But also the fact that that memorial even happened because it wasn't a typical war memorial. It was organized by veterans who wanted to like honor the fallen. Cause I think at that point, the Vietnam veteran, the Vietnam war was so controversial that the government like wasn't looking for an opportunity to call more attention to it mm -hmm. and so yeah like seeing her work made a huge impact on me and I still like think about it to this day because like she's completely she completely like reorganized and revisioned like how memorials function and what they look like and sometimes it's forgotten the controversy surrounding um her selection and design and then I think when I was um the summer after high school I think it was my first time going to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago and mm -hmm. I saw a work by Adrian Piper called Cornered that's mm -hmm. like a video installation where her head like it's almost like she's a news anchor and a television monitor and she's just staring out at you mm -hmm. and telling you um uh I think she's like assuming that you're like a white art visitor 
um, to a gallery or museum and she's basically like explaining um, like uh, black racial identity in America and how you're like implicated in it. And I just remember being like, this artwork's talking to me. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure if I match who she's talking to, but it, um, and I think in the same gallery, there's a work by Carrie James Marshall that dealt with like, um, like the legacy of the civil rights movement. And I was like, oh, these works are like talking. And it's not just like, I grew up like with the Art Institute of Chicago's collection. And if you spend enough time there, um, you get that sense that like art is made by dead French white men, <laughs> <laughs> or at least European, dead European men. <laughs> and it's like, I, it was the first time I could kind of like um, realize that art made in our time resonated in a really different way and I've always been really interested in um like how art speaks and so sometimes I assign like personality characteristics to artworks like is this artwork like does it have its arms crossed and it's stern is it like welcoming is it like posing a question right and like with especially with like Adrian Piper's work, it took me like years to really develop like a robust relationship with that work since, um, and it was only like in grad school when um, uh, I took a class called Starting with Adrian Piper that I realized like the impact of that work on me. So I really like when you can have a long conversation over several years and you can like grow and change with an artwork <laughs> in your life. So um, I think those artworks were extremely impactful. And like since then learning about like the work of Emery Douglas, who is the Minister of Culture for the Black Panther Party, mm -hmm. um, Barbara Carrasco, um, who is actually a friend in LA now, um, learning about her work with the United Farm Workers mm -hmm. Movement, artists like Barbara Kruger, who uses like text and the language of advertising and this kind of like agitprop way and then um like Faith Ringgold who's um her work is like so powerful in terms of like storytelling and like personal lore mm -hmm. so I'm just like those are artists like I just have in mind a lot of the time mm -hmm. as people who I want to like my work to be in conversation with mm -hmm. There's so many parallels with that in the education world, especially this idea you mentioned about accessing an information or accessing a piece from different vantage points as you grow, you know, within English departments across the country, uh, teachers are reinvestigating the books that they read in their curriculum. And if they're maintaining certain texts, they're trying to incorporate different perspectives to sort of make the picture more holistic about the text. And we can really talk about it in a more meaningful way. Um, in my class, we're reading the Odyssey. And yeah. the, in the thousands of years that has been read, only one woman has translated it. And we're reading hmm. the trans. Yeah version right we're reading the translated version by the woman emily wilson and it we are investigating the ways in which language has been changed to bring some things to light um and it really has that's one of the few artworks by dead european men that have mm -hmm. sort of been really pushed to make it a more global experience instead of like something that has been chatted on and it's established as a great and some folks are doing that with um Shakespeare as well something that was very interesting to me and again we always think about this in terms of writing in English is audience and intent yeah. and you mentioning the Milam uh, document uh Vietnam War memorial and this idea of aesthetic vision and her incorporating her identity into it now when you are talking to these community cultural barriers are there conversations about intent, intended audience and how to frame your work for those specific audiences? And on top of that, have you found that those conversations, if they happened, limiting and how you can express your art? You know, I try to think of those questions. I, I tend to think of limitations as 
like possibilities because then you have like more of a challenge to work up against. So there's no single audience, for example, of the LA Metro artwork. It's like, a tr it's going to be a transit hub in downtown LA. So you're going to have people who are going to work every day. You're going to have people who are like tourists. You're going to have residents of the community immediately surrounding it. And so I think there's a temptation when you have such a diverse audience to kind of aim for a quote unquote universal. And I always push up against the idea of like universality. Like I'm so interested in the details. I'm so interested in like the specifics. Cause like, that's where you can like locate humanity. <laughs> I know that's like a kind of general sounding statement, but it's like, I wanted to make a project that where community members and community storytellers felt seen and those they could point to it and say those are my stories those are my people and also um tell the story in a way that people who saw the piece once or could or who would see it like every day could have points of entry and ways to unpack the piece and so i think i just basically spent like four years like packing this piece with iconography that could unfold over time mm -hmm. as people like learned about who they're looking at in the piece because um it, it was really daunting to be invited to make the piece because it's a permanent like monumental size um, public artwork in the heart of LA mm -hmm. and so I know in my contract they like guarantee it for like 25 years and it, it could be there much much longer and so it's like not just an audience of today but like oh what will this mean in 40 years from now you know when my son's children look at it and like where will we be as a city as a country you know like there is the risk of a work becoming like dated quote unquote but i think it i wanted to put like various stories from the past like in conversation with like what's going on right now and to acknowledge the time uh -huh. in which it's being made and like I've worked on this worked on the piece from like 2016 to 2019 and very much overlapping like with the Trump administration and it's mm -hmm. like what what do we hope for like beyond this moment because it would it's not even open to the public for like a few years um but i think those questions of audience are really important and i also don't think the conversation is fixed like i don't i don't want it to be like i'm just saying something and dropping it like i want people to like resonate and react and to like change along with how they interpret the work over time um but that's that's a hope i think it's like different for everyone um, mm -hmm and their relationship to it. Yeah, absolutely. There, That is a, a very pertinent thought of ideas becoming dated or somehow unrelatable to future generations. And you, you say that one of your hopes is that they're within the specifics of it, and apologize if I'm misframing it, within the specifics of it there's a you can find the humanity in the in the work and the people who the work is supposed to describe and maybe yeah. from there there is a universality that can be drawn but it has to be specific it can't just be this sort of amoebus thing which may allow for it to become opaque and dated over time because you're trying to do so much and pull on so many angles which sounds like the struggle of a teacher at once to sort of see what lands instead of like we know what's going to land we know what's going to stick as my community bearer I want you to tell this specific story because I know it will stick and mm -hmm. rely on that story to do the work and to right. provide the longevity into infinity and beyond per se um yeah and I think it's important to tell like timely stories within a permanent medium yeah. you know I feel like um like the work that we study from antiquity has survived for thousands of years but they were telling the stories of their time you know and we can still pull meaning from it and um 
of course our point of view on it is different from their lived experience mm -hmm. but it's like it's like kind of they're sending like a telegram from the past yeah. you know and it's a way to like um allow those conversations to like cross space and time mm -hmm. now speaking of your artwork i'm going to share with everyone some of the images on the mural that's going to be put into LA me uh, Metro. Let me know, give me a, th oh, you, they can't give me a thumbs up if they see it, but um, here. So while you're talking about your sort of hopes and dreams, you want to walk everyone through this beautiful mosaic of work you have. Sure, um, so I'm sh going to be showing like four, pan four out of the 14 panels that will be on the subway platform level of this um, metro station that's at first and central in um, little tokyo and um, i chose images that relate to this conversation about racial justice um because i i think one of the goals of my work is to like make intersectionality visible and um i think a a huge uh uh impetus for these images is that as I was talking to people of different generations um, in the JA Japanese American community, they were concerned that future generations would lose a connection to the experience of internment during World War II. So that's when FDR passed on the executive order 9066 and, um, and um, rounded up uh, Japanese American uh, residents of the West Coast and imprisoned them in remote locations around the US um, during World War II. And um, some of the people that I worked with were born in camp um, or their parents were, or their grandparents were there. And it really like marked their experience of what it means to be in the US and mm -hmm. their relationship with the government and that time period. And the piece is called Willpower Allegory. I specifically used the acronym of the Works Progress Administration since um, FDR, he was so famous for um, his New Deal policies, um, which in retrospect shut out a lot of people of color <laughs> from the benefits, benefits of those social programs. Um, and to think that within a few years, he'd be like buying into racist hysteria around the war and um, and incarcerating uh, Japanese Americans is like this kind of undercurrent of the piece. Um, but what you have, what you see here are people who are survivors of camp who are carrying the banners representing the different um, camps uh, in what's now an annual uh, commemoration of the Day of Remembrance and I attended um, one or two of these events and it's both like a solemn experience, but also there's so much pride in the work of like keeping memory alive. And these are like the memory keepers of this time period. And um, what you see are like people either as they look today or some of the people are shown as they appeared like during World War II. And I wanted there to be that like slippage of time and representation. And you also like along all the bottom of the panels is um, a procession that at times feels like the Bon Odori honoring of ancestors. That's a Japanese tradition. And at times it looks like a parade, at times it looks like a protest. But in the panel on the left, it also shows people at different moments of incarceration for when they were removed from their um, removed from their homes, arriving at camp, and then the moment of being released from camp. Um, and so on the right uh, is the Manzanar obelisk that was created in the cemetery of the Manzanar um, internment camp in California. And um, I just, uh, I also, when I was there at the Manzanar pilgrimage, um, I took a photo of this incredible display of like paper cranes that was around it. And I I wanted 
these two panels especially to talk about how um, there's this experience embodied both like a collective trauma experienced um, by the Japanese American community, but also like within it, there's like so much resilience and also how much it inspired like the civil rights activism of um, like the people depicted, like there's Yuri Kochiyama and Edison Uno and like there's like poets and designers and people who um, the experience like informed who they were as a person, but also that they could um, uh, really, I wanted to show the fullness of the lives that like came out of the camps too. Um, mm -hmm. I think there was a question or these panels do appear next to each other. So there's um, uh, in the subway station, standing on the platform on one wall, there will be seven and then they'll be faced by another seven. And um, each one measures about 12 and a half by 13 feet. And so they'll kind of like be rising up on the wall from where you're standing. Um, so in the next slide, um, uh, are two other panels I wanted to talk about. So the one on the left um, depicts the Tongva Nation and they're the indigenous peoples of the Los Angeles Basin. And um, I, the woman in the center is Julia Bogany. She's a tribal elder who I met through the process of working on the Metro project. And she's an in incredible person. She's like organizing, I think she's edited now like a few volumes of a Tongva dictionary. And she's shown there with her great granddaughters and she's um, president of the Kuruvunga Springs. So it's a ceremonial sacred site that's in West LA. Um, and she invited me to, um, to come to their annual celebration at the Springs. And I think this was the year that at least in LA, Columbus Day was officially changed to Indigenous Peoples Day. Mm -hmm. And so it was really like a cause for celebration because that was like decades of advocacy to make that happen. I'm sure it's like the kind of thing that when they first proposed it, I'm sure they only receive pushback, you know, and sometimes you just have to like keep pushing over so many years to make that culture shift. And sometimes culture like has to catch up um, mm -hmm. to where people are at. Um, and um, the Tongva community has, uh, I mean, from point of contact has faced so much like violence and erasure from the missions and the government, um, but I wanted, them to very much be a part of this piece because it's like the statement of like, we are here <laughs> and not only are we here, we're thriving. We're like, we're still connecting with our ancestors, trying to connect with like who we are as a people despite um, like so much official attempts at erasure of like them physically and also culturally like, um, like with the boarding schools from um, centuries ago where children would be like separated from their families and basically like punished for expressing any tribal affiliation um, to like the kind of work that Julia is doing today in terms of like working with the younger generation to keep that energy going. Um, and so I wanted to honor them also because I was very aware that the subway station is literally like a hole dug out of the heart of LA. Like they're finding like archeological um, elements that just like point back to the history. So it's like a huge wow. honor um, and also responsibility to place permanent artwork into that space. And so I very much wanted um, the Tongva Nation to be represented and like people today who are um, doing that work to connect um, with their community. And um, on the right is a panel showing um, residents and activists and artists connected to Skid Row um, in LA. And um, the man in the white t-shirt under the Skid Row city limit sign is General Jeff. And he had a huge influence on this um, on this particular panel, because when we first started talking, um, he said, 
you know, I don't want to talk to you if you're just going to show encampments and show like the unhoused people of LA in this kind of like downtrodden light. Like we don't need more of that. That's mm. like people already see the unhoused that way. I only want to talk to you if you're going to like honor who we are as people. Mm -hmm. And so that was, I think, a really important way to start the conversation. Um, and uh, the two pieces on the top, We the People of Skid Row and the Skid Row City Limits are actually, and also the photos that this middle grouping is based on are actually like public artworks created by and with the community in Skid Row. Mm -hmm. And we identified that as like a way to have their creative work present permanently in the station, which is literally just like a few blocks away um, from the Skid Row border, you could say. And um, so Danny Park, the guy on the left with the peace sign, he, um, his, his parents like own a bodega, he's Korean American um, in Skid Row. And so he kind of like grew up uh, with that community. And so those images are from like portraits that he took mm -hmm. and then uh, and there's a tree in the middle that was put up by um uh like urban environmental activists to honor barbara brown and a man named africa who um i think barbara brown uh was an elderly woman who like died from exposure and neglect um on skid row and africa was um murdered by police by the lapd and so even though that tree didn't end up surviving, like putting it within this piece was a way to keep their memories alive too. Mm -hmm. um, and then along the bottom is um, this parade. I think it happens semi-annually. That's organized by the Los Angeles Poverty Department. That's mm -hmm. run by um, John Malpede and Henrietta Bra Bowers. They're the third and fourth people in that line on the bottom. And there, uh, it's this, uh, it's called Walk the Talk. And it's this incredible like musical parade where they commission like portraits of Skid Row activists, some of whom are still alive, some of whom have passed, mm -hmm. some of whom were residents and some of whom like who started organizations to benefit the community. And it's this celebration of like also the artists and poets and musicians of Skid Row and so um, although it's called like the Little Tokyo Arts District Station, I wanted it to kind of like put all these communities that are like neighbors of each other and like put them in a shared space um, in the station. Hmm. And um, so I'm also going to be working on a kind of guide to the piece because I know that like uh, a question I've gotten many times in which I anticipated was like, how can we learn more about who's in the piece? And like, that actually is really important to me. Like I consider myself an educator too. I would say that like asking, like, do I consider myself an activist? I would also guess, I would say I consider my art as a form of education mm -hmm. as well. Um, and um, so I, I want to you know, provide resources like if educators or like the general public want to kind of like uh, unpack these stories, learn about the history of the Tongva, learn mm -hmm. about um, like the activism and community on Skid Row, you know, like that I can kind of, this can be an entry point mm -hmm. or like a, a way to do storytelling and to like build community mm. power and energy. Um, and so, oh yeah, I think there's some comments that like the two pieces are the way the people of Skid Row and Skid Row City Limit are like really amazing works because it uses like the seal of the city of Los Angeles and that kind of iconic freeway signage in yeah. this really subversive way. Mm -hmm. um, because like even right now they're fighting to um, have their own neighborhood council, basically fighting to have a seat at the table because mm -hmm. um, it is a neighborhood unto itself, a neighborhood that's like disenfranchised and terrorized and mm -hmm. neglected and criminalized, you know? Yeah, and absolutely. and um, I think they understand the need 
to have political power. And so I hope this piece can kind of contribute to their like visibility in this way. And also like the Tongva nation isn't a federally recognized tribe. Like they um, are doing a lot of amazing work and um, but at the same time, like they're not, they don't get the quote unquote benefits from the federal government because they're not like officially recognized even though they, you know, are the people like of the LA basin, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm, right. Um, so yeah, so that's, those are, there's gonna be 14 panels in total. So I, I want the piece to be like read in the round as a whole to have all these stories kind of like talking to each other and for you to be in the middle of the storytelling. Um, but, you know, I don't even know what it looks like at scale. I don't have a studio the size of a subway station. So I've been working like digitally on making these designs and then it's gonna be fabricated in porcelain enamel steel. Mm. Um, so come to LA in 2022. <laughs> Singly, that's a sign. Once everything is hopefully in a more reasonable state of things so you can travel, make a plan oh, yeah. to come to LA in 2022 to see this in action. Now you kind or of- Or any time after that. <laughs> right, or any time after that. <laughs> but, but it's going to be up. Now you sort of hinted at this when you were describing the, how you're going to imagine the panel from a small scale to a large scale. But when conceiving a project and beginning a project, what is your process? Uh -huh. um, I guess we can go to the next slide too. Um, since for the Metro project, I went into it um, mm -hmm. just like knowing that I had a lot of questions and that it would be a lot of conversations and listening and trying to translate that into images. Um, and uh, I've, for the past year, I've been an artist in residence with the ACLU of Southern California. And I was so excited to kind of move from this piece that's like about um, kind of like posterity and um, a permanent piece to like being involved in really campaign-based work that's responding to this moment. And so, um, so this is one of the pieces that they, um, that we worked on together. It was for a campaign called Ice is Not Welcome Here. And it's specifically, it's more of a long-term campaign, but this is a component that launched it. Um, that was, it's a know your rights education campaign to help um, residents, uh, residents, whether it's undocumented people or their neighbors, like understand their rights. Um, given that ICE agents were like masquerading as police um, and using like lies and ruses to get people to open their doors or come inside and exposing themselves to like arrest and detention. Mm -hmm. And so um, they had in mind this character, Nina, um, who was a Latinx, young Latinx girl standing up for her family and her community. Um, and I also wanted to show like how diverse the undocumented folks who are impacted by ICE detention are, um, although less visible. Um, I mean, there's Latinx um, people, like people from the Caribbean and Africa, Muslim um, immigrants, also like Asian immigrants as well. And um, the English translation of this says, this is our community, we know our rights. We don't, um, the English version is, uh, we don't, uh, we, ICE is not welcome here and we like don't authorize entry to ICE. Um, and um, in the next slide, you can also see that these images kind of branched out into like graphics that were more illustrated. Um, like what do you do if ICE is at your door? Um, and they specifically wanted like a really like friendly aesthetic. Mm. Um, even though like what's, especially what's being depicted, they have this incredible mobile justice app. Um, uh, and I recommend everyone download it. It's like an app where you can record video and you can automatically send it to the ACLU as like intake and evidence. Um, so if like you witness like an ICE raid, um, they can um, mobilize around that. Um, and then, 
so oh wait was your question about um the goals of the work it's or, all tied or where to you begin yes. and let me yeah. know if we should move faster or farther along um in the no, talk. No, we're, we're, we're good timing um okay yeah, minutes of this portion and then we'll get into some of the i'm going to check to see if there are questions in the panel or in the chat that we can answer that you haven't already covered okay yeah, and um, I was doing this work around the time that the quarantine started. Um, so there were going to be like rallies and actions and press conferences and demonstrations, but um, the work kind of moved into more of like a digital activism space online. Um, and so I can show you a few more examples of work that I did with them. So in the next slide, um, so a lot of these were shared on um, like social media and for Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, um, I worked with them to, we came up with this list of um, Asian American activists and historical figures who really exemplified like intersectional um, social justice work. And so Nai Nguyen and Falsok, um, I think Nai is based in the, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. Um, I think she's based more in the Bay Area and Falsok is based in the LA area. They both happen to be um, Cambodian American and Nai is like a legal advocate who um, uh, is an advocate for the survived and punished coalition um, to um, end detention and incarceration of domestic violence and sexual abuse survivors because um, that was her own lived experience, um, having been um, incarcerated for the crime of an ex who abused her. And then Falsok was incarcerated as a teenager um, and tries, tried as an adult. Um, and then when I think he was pardoned, he was immediately transferred into um, ICE uh, for deportation. And so he was able to, um, he was ultimately able to like escape the system after like petitioning the governor. But it just shows like how within like a single person story, all these different systems can um, intersect and how they can like use that to help others who are in a similar situation. And so we had, um, figures like Grace Lee Boggs and Yuri Kochiyama and even like Wong Kim Ark, who is like the origin of birthright citizenship mm. featured. And that was really like great for me to like learn more about like Asian American history because Asian American history is like very understudied and underpresented. Um, and that's really to our disadvantage. You know, there's so much, um, so much that can inform how we even think about like what being an American means that's mm -hmm. in um, that's in that uh, context and so in the next slide um, these were portraits so a lot of the work that I did with um, the ACLU they're really interested in portraits to like uplift um, these stories and their stories were like most often like in the captions um, so, but I'm kind of filling that in right now. So Juice and Navi Husky were um, trans siblings who went to Coachella for Baychella or Beachella. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and separately, but at the same time, I guess, um, they both went to um, use the public restrooms and they were both like gender discriminated against. Um, and they reached out to the ACLU afterwards and they worked with the ACLU's um, LGBT um, rights or gender equity and reproductive justice team to um, uh, write letters to the company that like owns Coachella to make sure that they comply with California law, which prohibits gender discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just like an amazing duo and then Christine Lily Renee Wood, um, uh, she was a member of like Crunch Fitness in the San Diego area. And she talks about like how, um, like going to the gym was like such an important part of her transition also in that 
it was like this kind of liberatory space for her and her relationship with her body, but that um, she was prohibited from using the women's um, facilities in the women's changing room at the gym. Um, and so she was part of a suit um, with the ACLU SoCal like against um, crunch fitness to order them to comply with California law as well. Mm -hmm. And so I've just been so um, interested in like the role of impact litigation mm -hmm. and, the, and how lawyers can like transform like the testimonies and lived experiences of people who reach out to the organization to like build a case to um, help mobilize that story to help so many other people who are in a, in a similar situation. Um, so those were portraits for Pride Month. And then in the next slide. We have a question too. That's actually okay. to all of these, all of the panels that you've shown us so far. Um, coming from Marsha Grant, class of 60. Yes. What medium are you using for these extraordinary panels? Are you painting them as a pastel? What medium are you using? So I have been living on my iPad Pro <laughs> plug for <laughs> Apple for the last several years. Um, like even for the Metro project, ultimately I had to like deliver a digital file to go to the fabricator. And so I've been working between like the iPad Pro, Apple Pencil, shout out, <laughs> product placement, um, and um, Adobe Illustrator, which is like a vector-based program so you could put work in there and if it's vector based, it can be as tall as a skyscraper or as small as like a notebook and it maintains like the quality of the image. Um, a lot of the drawings I did for um, these portraits that look more like pencil or pastel or watercolor um, are actually done in this program called Procreate um, that's on the iPad. So, but I always, um, I'm kind of always interested in making digital art look like analog mm. art as well. But um, yeah, I basically, my studio is like a computer in my bedroom <laughs> and um, like my iPad. Yeah, so Amazing. I'm, I'm always like trying to figure out if and when I'm going to like properly rent a studio, but rent in LA is not cheap. Um, yeah. And I just have to like, because I've been working digitally for so long, I'm so used to it, but I kind of want to get out of that. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it changed well. your relationship. I can imagine it would change your relationship to what you're you're drawing um, and what you're trying to communicate. Whereas, you know, going through the motions with your hands and that mm -hmm. meticulous process, I can imagine there is sort of a connection there that can be fostered that I, I don't know, maybe not be there with the digital art, who knows? I mean, this is conversations we're having in uh, education where you know we're moving in a combination of all the different learning styles and learning disabilities moving from more paper format to more digital formats of things and typing, yeah. writing. So there is that conversation, is this the next step of art? Are we moving away from you know a more traditional analog form to a more digital form that recreates the analog and does that you know change how we you know the how we see art and how art is used and how is it how accessible it is not just in terms of the subject matter of the art but who can do art um mm -hmm. because you know with anything there's sort of these rings and hierarchies and traditions that you sort of go through and now that we find in an age where things are digitalized and we, we're seeing videos and all sort of things communicating what's going on it's sort of if you have these means you can show this message yeah and I will say that it makes sharing the artwork a lot easier. So a lot of these drawings were meant to like circulate on social media. Like these portraits were um, destined for like YouTube videos. So if you like, if you go to the ACLU of Southern California's YouTube page, you can like watch the videos where you can hear their voices. Um, and so none of the artwork that I've shown thus far was like intended for like a gallery based 
experience. And so there are like pros and uh, advantages to working digitally in terms of like disseminating it. Um, but it's, I think it's a different and related experience to experience like work physically. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's allowed me to make work a lot. It's been really great for making like public art <laughs> because um, yeah, like I worked on that Illustrator file for like four years, like taking things in, putting, uh, putting things in, taking things out and working in this like non-linear, almost more of like an editing space um, as opposed to just like um, working um, from like beginning to end, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I, I was just like constantly moving things around and um, reorganizing the compositions in a way that I wouldn't be able to do if I were working um, analog. Um, but I always like pivoting. Um, so I'm kind of excited to like do watercolor next year. <laughs> <laughs> right, to get back, get, so to get back to the blue thing. Yeah, all. yeah. You have another um, question from uh -huh. Eldridge, class of 61. Oh, hello. Hi, right, he was there. Swarth Swarthmore legend. <laughs> yes, um, your work is exciting and educational. I think the arts broadly are important as a part of education, K through 12 and beyond. I find your work educational in and of itself. Can you imagine education for all in our education systems? When were uh, you aware of the Chester's Children Chorus at Swarthmore? Oh, um, I mean, I think we have to imagine education and education equity for it to, for us to be able to work towards it. And um, I think it's so great, the opportunities for like Swarthmore students and staff and educators to like connect, like for example, through the children's course, I learned about it, you know, going to the concerts and whatnot. And um, yeah, so, so yes, I think that's incredibly important. And also I think there, what, happens is like everyone starts off making art and I think as education progresses um the arts are often the first thing to be cut um even though there's lots of data though we shouldn't just have to rely on data to prove the validity of art um that it should be part of like steam as opposed to just stem education and um that it's a way for kids to like grow and think that may not be served by just like straight book learning as well. And it activates like different parts of their like empathy and ways of expressing themselves. And so I think it's um, like the ACLU of Southern California has a youth liberty squad and they do lots of um, artivism, like art activism work. Um, and that is just, like understood to be an important part of like movement building. Um, and so I am a strong advocate of everyone considering themselves an artist. Like I may be working on art professionally and it's taken a lot to like get to the point where I'm doing it full time. Um, uh, but I it makes me like really sad inside when people say, oh, I used to make art or Mm -hmm. Um, I would draw, but I'm bad at it. You know, like I, I think I was telling you earlier, I was, I stopped drawing like the minute I went to grad school. Cause I was just like, okay. Um, I feel like this is a conceptual program. I went to Cal arts and I just wanted to like explore other ways of making, but it took me a long time to cycle back. And it kind of felt like getting back on a bike again. And mm -hmm. so, um, there's like different life cycles of art making. That I think mm -hmm. everyone should have in their life, but it makes me sad when people feel like so cut off from the process. Yeah, I'm hoping that that remedies itself because I'm a huge, huge, huge proponent of arts in schools because for a student like me, that helped communicate a lot of emotions that I didn't feel very comfortable expressing in the written form and in dialogue yeah. in the communities that I wasn't part of. 
and I'm seeing it definitely for my students um, as well as that as like their calming process. I'm like, yeah, doodle, yeah, draw while you're reading if it helps you concentrate and focus and it leads to these ideas that you can express across different genres. Um, it's very important. That sort of actually links back to our conversation we had before this. And this goes back to our, this question by Boki Yoon um, class of 2001, that sort of connects to what we were talking about earlier in terms of the eras in which we find ourselves um, connecting to art and how we communicate art and in general and activism. Thinking back to your undergrad time, mm -hmm. You did. How did your time at Swarthmore sort of help you find your style and vision and deepen your activism? And on top of that, how, do you find yourself sort of revisiting that those that moment in time to draw inspiration for the work you're doing now? Yeah, I remember I wrote my admission essay about how I loved art and political science. <laughs> and I think I've just been like pretty consistent about having those interest in life um um and uh that's very much like inspired by um like my father like telling me about um like growing up in communist china and trying to understand like what does it mean to be like born into rev uh like a communist revolution you know like what does it mean for me to like be born into the united states in the 80s you know and um like i think about that um though I would, in the next slide, you can actually see, if I deal with that a bit more in my personal work. Like, what does it mean for my son to be like born into LA as like a Chinese Jamaican boy, you know? And like, I won't really know how to, he'll have to figure out how to make that experience his own, you know? And like, um, here's like, a, so I, these are like analog works, but they have a lot in common with the way I work digitally too. So that's an altar to my grandmother as part of the Dia de los Muertos exhibition. Mm. Um, but um, being at Swarthmore was so great because I was like an artist within a community that had so many different interests and areas of specialty. So like people were doing theater, people were doing engineering, people were gonna be doctors, lawyers, you know, um, teachers and I very much saw art as like being part of a larger community and process and like a community that's like social justice oriented. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember, I think it was maybe in my second year, um, I was talking to Randy Exxon, who was an incredible mentor. And I was like having some doubts about like pursuing art, like beyond college. So I was like, should I kind of pivot to like a public policy track because I was really kind of fascinated about like government-based work. Um, and he said, Audrey, your contribution to society will be through your art. And I, I don't even know that I had words to respond to him at that time, but like I've been trying to like live up to that wisdom like ever since then. And, um, and trying to understand like, okay, I can, I can put all that um, passion for like political change like into the work that I'm doing in like visual culture. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think a place where it really connected to me was like freshman year, I started doing like editorial cartoons for the Phoenix and it was very like self-guided. And um, I had these like assignments every week and I just like had to figure out how to translate like the fact that 9-11 just happened into an editorial mm -hmm. cartoon. It was like this, these assignments that were just so like bigger than anything I had done before, even if it was just like a tiny drawing that would be like in the paper in a few days. Um, and um, yeah, so I mean, my time at Swarthmore overlapped with like the Bush administration. Mm -hmm. And so it created this kind of like um, backdrop to the work we were doing um, and yeah so that doing those drawings and cartoons like it talked back and forth to the work that I was doing in like the studio art um, context as well and um, yeah so I'm always kind of like dancing between 
um, like social commentary and representation at large and like really personal storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I think the, especially with the Metro project, like I took the things that I learned from telling like my own story or my family's story into the process of telling other people's stories, like that amount of um, tenderness, I guess, and um, responsibility, <laughs> but also that there needs to be like play and joy as well um, and within those, those representations. Um, yeah. So like going, I thought a lot about my time at Swarthmore when I was applying to the ACLU residency um, because I'm like, I'm finally getting to do the art plus policy <laughs> plus advocacy thing that I was always like excited to do. Cause like when you're going through an MFA program I think the assumption is that you're, you're being trained for like in contemporary art world context. Mm -hmm. And um, there were certain things about my personal interests that just like weren't a hundred percent met um, uh, from that uh, track or that path. Um, mm -hmm. And the opportunity to work in like civic contexts, like in public art and um, like being part of the day-to-day -day legal advocacy work of the ACLU that like really was so, so satisfying mm -hmm. and represented um, a lot of the aspirations I had undergrad. Mm. Now this fine, this is actually gonna be our final question because I realized we we could keep on going as Swarthmore. Oh. Dude, I'm so long-winded. No, um, no, I haven't been in like a Swarthmore <laughs> discursive space in so long that I'm just yeah. like really excited. <laughs> no, and I mean, it's always, as we talked about before this, it's always so central how at some points, the farther away we rem are removed from Swarthmore, the more times we find we come back into this space because it's, it's sort of needed. There's not a lot of spaces in our lives to parcel out in a real meaningful way, what mm -hmm. is happening with us, how our place is in society, all of those sort of large existential questions we had time for while in Sharples and the McCabe. We, we, oh, yeah. we us doing it digitally or if we encounter people in our own lives. And sort of this final question is connected to that larger point um, as we've conversed here, um, given this is from and Andrea or Andrea, apologies for the um, name pronunciation, Packard, but given the challenges art majors face today, um, do you have advice for Swarthmore students and others who may not be considered artists um, who want to place a creative practice at the center of their life? Oh, hey, Andrea. I worked for Andrea at the List Gallery when I was an undergrad, so it's great to hear from her. Um, Oh, okay, so I actually had a recent art major um, who graduated reach out to me with the advice and I think it's, um, man, it's, it's hard to give a like step-by-step -step kind of advice, but I think in pursuing creative work, uh, a reality is that you have to kind of sacrifice some stability, whereas, um, and this is a thing that actually results in a lot of people not being able to continue being artists. Um, and something like, for instance, of the people that I went to even grad school with, a lot of people were just like saddled with loans um, the day they graduated. And it's like, I was like, you have to, it can take years to build any kind of sustainability, especially in cities where like art hubs are because they tend to be very expensive places to live and work. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess it depends on your goals because like um, if you want to live off your work, um, that's one thing. Up until when I got the Metro Commission, I was working in museum education. And so I knew that if I wanted to stay in LA, I had to do my artwork on like nights and weekends. Mm -hmm. um and some people you know like rock it into the art world like from like while they're still in school some people can take like another 10 15 years you know um 
And so I guess it depends like how much one values um, like financial stability, Mm -hmm. Um, but also like uh, that being said, like the digital art conversation was really interesting because it is a kind of democratizing approach because like Mm -hmm. you don't have to have a studio to make an oil painting you know Mm -hmm. what I mean like now there are so many tools that are so accessible like on a consumer level that weren't even when I was like in college like um the fact that like anyone can make a movie on their phone like that's great (laughs) and uh so I think um in terms of something being called like capital A art, like the systems of like validation Mm -hmm. um, in society for like what's allowed to be called art, I think can be kind of toxic Mm -hmm. as far as this conversation is concerned. And um, like, I don't even think that the, what's called the capital A art world really encompasses like the full range of culture that's valuable in our society. Mm -hmm. And, like elite spaces kind of pick and choose when they'll lift up, for example, like community-based work to um, be respected like on the same level as people that um, follow a a more traditional path. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's like thinking about like the Chicano um, mural tradition in LA, it's like um, those artists like weren't allowed into galleries and museum spaces. They had to put their messages like on the walls of their neighborhoods, you know? And it has like a different power and a different charge, but also it like, it's uh, acknowledging a kind of like exclusionary practices um, within capital like A art spaces. So um, I have a lot of, ambivalence around those categories because I see where they can benefit and where they can detract um, from different types of culture being valued. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of a, a kind of creative tension that I think mm-hmm. about a lot. Mm. Well, that is, that was a wonderful way to end it off. Um, Beautiful. Thank you so much, Audrey, again, for taking the time out of your wonderful activist, artivist, as alumnus Jody, alumnus Jody Williams said, your artivist life to share some of the world that shared with us what you've been doing and sort of bringing voice to communities that have felt voiceless and giving us, you know, a lot to chew on. Um, Is there a way folks can see your art online or keep track of what you're doing in case they have any questions for you? Oh, sure. Um, I have a website, it's Um, audreychan.net. A-U-D-R-E-Y-C-H-A-N dot N-E-T. So I tend to kind of use that as a uh, collection of work that I've done in the past. Um, So yeah, no, I, this has been, really lovely and I'm, I'm just like oh I wish we could talk for like five more hours but I think we don't have time for that <laughs> we have to <laughs> we'll have to do a part two our... or something I have to talk yeah to yeah, yeah 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 we, we can get a part two back to our quarantine realities um but thank you so much um to Tuan to the alumni council and to everyone that is on the call or um and or ask questions um fourth more love I have lots Lots yes, thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Boki. Thank you, Alumnix Council. And please, um, as I said before, this uh, video cast will be up hopefully in the next two, three weeks on the website. Otherwise, stay tuned for more enticing and wonderful investigatory panels on racial justice in various forms. And we'll be talking to you soon. Good morning, good night, good evening, and good afternoon. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank you.